thanks everyone uh, for coming to the first event in this year's Aeris Craft Speaker Series, What is Solidarity? My name is Yuri, and I'm a graduate, graduate student, and I'm also the research assistant for this series, and I'll be co-moderating this event with Amina Lalor. First off, I'd like to thank you for coming to the first conversation in this year's Aeris Craft Speaker Series, which will look at movements, research, and design for another world. The central title question of this asks a crucial question, how can we as architects participate in collective long-term social movements for change and advocate within and beyond our professional obligations? Over the fall and winter term, the series welcomes activists, researchers, designers, and artists tied to various social movements demanding indigenous land sovereignty, disability justice, abolition of police and prisons, the right to secure housing, non-extractive construction, and access to culturally nourishing food. Each session will bring three speakers into conversation about how their work supports land back, disability justice, abolition, right to remain, anti-extractivism, and food sovereignty, and how to imagine and, and to imagine how architects might support these movements. Running parallel will be student-led workshops designed to facilitate deeper discussions about how solidarities might resonate within our school and beyond. The first workshop, Land Stories, will be tomorrow night from 7 to 8 p.m. and will feature speakers Amina Lalor, Dan Danny Castellin Longlade, and Tony Kipling. Both faculty and students are welcome to attend and participate. The What is Solidarity series is curated by faculty members Adrian Blackwell and Jane Hutton, myself as research assistant, and students representing various groups. Rick Manth of Light, representing Treaty Land's Global Stories, Jane Manboat, representing Bridge, and Nicole Rack representing the Sustainability Collective. As we begin today's lecture, it's important that we first and foremost recognize the territory we occupy. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, a swath of land 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. This land was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River and is within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Given the location of our school on the Haldeman Tract and our role as architects and designers, tonight we reflect on how we have been complicit in the ongoing processes of colonization. Part of working towards a decolonized future is recognizing that colonization has not simply been a process of physical displacement, but an active and ongoing destruction of indigenous people's ways of life. Any meaningful attempts to restore our relationship to the earth must happen in solidarity with the ongoing work of land protectors and center Indigenous knowledge and voices. We hope tonight's discussion serves as a stepping stone towards working in solidarity with local land back movements. Thank you, and I'm going to hand it off to Amina to introduce tonight's topic and speakers. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, Thank you, Mary, and uh, the What is Solidarity lecture series team for bringing us all together today. Um, as Mary mentioned, my name is Amina Lawler. Um, I am of Vietnamese, Irish, and Métis descent, and I grew up near a tributary of the Don River north of Toronto on Mississauga Territory. I'm a recent graduate of the master's program at Waterloo Architecture and currently an adjunct lecturer in the 2A studio here at the school. I'm also working as a researcher and coordinator for Nookums House, an indigenous land-based research lab at the University of Guelph with scholars Kim Anderson, Sherry Longboat, and Brittany Luby. In June of 2020, the land back camp, Ose Gonyo Hadaje, meaning Willow River, the Mohawk word for the Grand River, set up in Kitchener's Victoria's, sorry, set up in Kitchener's Victoria Park. The camp organizers have demanded fees be waived for indigenous community events in the city, access to land in Victoria Park and Waterloo Park for traditional ceremonies, paid city staff positions for indigenous peoples, and a paid indigenous advisory board for full participation in the governance of municipal public spaces. At the same time, 1492 Landback Lane Camp has blocked the construction of a new suburb in Caledonia, adjacent to the Six Nations Reserve. Like these two camps, Waterloo architecture sits within the Haldeman Tract, land that the British Crown promised to the Six Nations in 1784. The current Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve inhabits only 5% of this granted territory. Recognizing that settler architecture is built on land appropriated from Indigenous peoples, 
how can architects resist a professional continuation of colonial practice and work in solidarity with indigenous communities? So our first speaker tonight is Amy Smoke, um, one of the organizers at Land Back Camp and someone I've had the immense pleasure of learning from in my time as a student um, through the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center. Amy Smoke is Mohawk Nation, Turtle Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River. Amy is a two-spirit mother, public speaker, community organizer, and singer. They have graduated from Conestoga College General Arts and Science, the University of Waterloo with a BA and BSW, as well as Wilfrid Laurier University with a Master's in Indigenous Social Work. Amy is one of the founding members of the Blue Sky Singers, is an active community and is an active community member here in Kitchener-Waterloo. Amy spends much of their time on social justice community organizing and public speaking in order to make visible Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. Having sat on various Indigenous advisory boards in the local community, Amy hopes to bring more First Nations, Métis, and Inuit education to organizations on the Haldeman Tract today. Um, usually, I guess I would say, uh, Let's all give a round of applause for Amy. Um, and so, Amy, are you, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Nyawa. Sego, sego, guego, Amy, smoke young gets. I am Mohawk Nation Turtle Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River. Round of applause for um, Amy. As Amina said, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm a local community member. Um, I have been to all three post-secondaries in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo area. And um, uh, prior to that, have spent a lot of um, years searching for my own identity. Um, I have been through many things, uh, substance abuse, um, homelessness, incarceration, uh, a number of the, uh, you know, intergenerational traumas from um, having residential schools in my family and um, struggled to find my identity uh, as a Indigenous person in a very um, white settler city, uh, as well as my identity as a two-spirit person. And um, in, as, as Amina explained, recent months, I, we're on day 94 here, June 20th, the day before National Indigenous People Day, um, a number of groups here in Kitchener-Waterloo, a number of community members, um, Black Indigenous people of colour here, were um, talking for weeks about occupying space, about reclaiming land, um, a number of the issues that were coming up were defund police and land back. And... Um, together with a number of people we sort of considered our council, we went ahead and put up a teepee uh, in the middle of downtown Kitchener's uh, Victoria Park. This is um, probably the most dangerous park in one of the most dangerous regions. Um, I, I believe statistics tell us it's one of three of the most dangerous parks in the region, particularly for women, um, sorry, in the country, particularly for women. And we chose the back of the park. I'm situated um, beyond the pavilion. If anybody knows, it's at 80 Schneider Street. We're, we're near the playground and the splash pad. And historically, this part of the park has been known to have a lot of um, anti-Black um, behavior going on back here, um, racism. <clears throat> a lot of criminal activity against uh, BIPOC folks in this community, as well as a lot of anti-LGBTQT um, criminal activity. There has been a lot of um, harm done to folks in this back corner. So we deliberately chose this space in order to put our bodies here and take back the land to make safe for um, Indigenous folks, for Black folks, for uh, queer and two-spirit folks. So we woke up on National Indigenous People Day and uh, had the TP up. We had a ceremony, a sunrise ceremony at five o'clock in the morning and started our occupation. Um, it was immediately halted by a number of um, park security and Waterloo Regional Police Services. The first in altercation with them 
didn't go great, but was not violent. I believe that they knew that they didn't know enough about our treaty rights to be on the land, to practice our uh, traditional practices here on the lands, to, to arrest us, to insist that we take this all down, um, that we are not trespassing, that we are peacefully occupying this space. And they went on their way which led to obviously the city being aware of of our presence here which led to um the mayors being aware of our presence here um we started out with three organizers um myself tara chartrand and my six-year-old daughter sky um who's been with me the entire time in the teepee we sleep in there and um, that was also somewhat deliberate. Sean Johnston joined us a, a couple weeks later. We are all um, two-spirit identifying. So with, you know, women, femme, two-spirit, and a child, it was very deliberate in taking back this space. We thought it would just be a couple of us sitting in front of a teepee in the park. And we were pleasantly surprised that a number of youth showed up on the second day. Um, you know, we thought, oh, we'll get torn down in a couple days. They would put up with us for that long. And some youth showed up, some Indigenous youth from the community who had actually grown up here and just never really accessed any of the services um, here in, in Kitchener-Waterloo. There are a number of great Indigenous organizations here, Healing Seven Generations and White Owl Native Ancestry Association. The post-secondaries all have Indigenous student centers, but these youth just didn't ever seem to find their place in the community. It turns out they identified as well as um, two-spirit or non-binary or trans. And we discovered sort of a gap then in, in, the serv in the services being provided by our organizations here in the cities. And they said, what can we do? What can we do to help? We want to come stay. And it grew. The camp grew. Uh, you know, a couple days later, a few more youth showed up and it grew even bigger. It started out with one teepee, one picnic table and one tent. And um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see behind me the teepee. We have a number of tents in the back where we have a number of campers. I'm going to we'll do a little walk around here with you. So we have our sacred fire here in the east, just outside the door, and that has been burning for 94 days. Um, we do only burn medicine and, you know, clean wood. Um, we have supplies under the tarps. We have fire pits. The sun is right in your eyes, I'm sure. So all of the camp tents behind me in a circle. And we have, you know, a utility tent, we have a kitchen tent, we have food prep, and then we have sort of an eating space here. Um, behind the teepee, you're not able to see it very well, but there's sort of a U-shaped garden that encircles the back of the teepee. Um, also something we just did. We didn't ask anybody if we were allowed to plant a garden in the middle of the park. We simply did. We were given seeds, we were given small plants, um, we were given a number of items in order to begin building that community garden. And it has provided us with an unbelievable amount of squash. Um, we have some tomatoes, we have eggplant, we've got some medicines, we have tobacco leaves that just flourished. So we came together in this space and just began to do our thing. We um, started meeting with the cities, um, both cities, after we came up with a petition on change.org with four demands, as Amina was saying, um, the rental fees of all public community city spaces be waived for indigenous folks to gather. It's um, a little insulting to have to pay for space on our own lands for us to gather for us to do what we need to do with fire um, on the land, with water, all of those things. Um, it can cost upwards of, you know, 500 up to several thousand dollars to rent space in the parks for our gatherings. Um, we wanted actual space. Um, 
space in the gar in the um, parks for sacred fires for these events. We wanted jobs. We want jobs in City Hall at all their levels um, for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit folks. Full-time paid positions, not temporary, not contract, not one year, not dependent on funding, as well as an advisory council um, of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit folks that is also to be paid, not like a board of directors where it's voluntary, where um, this is done in their spare time. We are we're concerned that City Hall needs to continue to be guided by, you know, a council of elders or knowledge carriers um, within the city on doing the work that they should be doing, um, you know, regarding the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation, um, 94 calls to action. Literally none of them have been done, you know, in, the, in these municipalities. So that was the fourth demand. So we had a number of events. We've had a number of events. Um, Cancel Canada Day on July 1st. We've had some drum circles singing. Uh, the local men's big drum has come down. We've had some drum making. Actually, my six-year-old made their first drum here. Um, a number of different things have gone on. What we did find was right from the start, it was clearly going to be an occupation. While we would love to have ceremony, we would love to have teachings and language and all of those amazing things for the youth here, uh, the racism, the overt racism, like all day, every day, was not something we were willing to subject uh, the rest of our community to. The elders we might bring in, the youth that would be here to witness that. It is not because we are Indigenous and, and now highly visible. Um, it's because of the racism within the city. And that came out clearly to us all day, every day. Um, so we turn our backs, we de-escalate. We've had a number of different situations where we've called out our settler ally friends to come and join us, to come and help protect us like a white shield um, to mediate these situations. Um, come, come collect your people. Uh, the urban infidels, proud boys, um, basically Nazis circling our camp um, the folks that uh, like to call out the Indian war cry at us, um, tell us all to go home, tell us all to get jobs. Um, it's, it's quite obvious to us that they don't even realize that we are still here. They don't even realize the lands in which they occupy and benefit from as stolen land. Um, and this has made everybody quite uncomfortable. So we have persevered we have lived through that we are on day 94 and the talks with the cities did continue we were on week 10 i think when we finally said i don't know why we're not me meeting more weekly or often we are literally sitting here waiting to have these uh requirements on the petition met and the city offered to start meeting weekly so we began that with a feast um, we shared food with a number of the city officials, and we began to um, discuss the four requirements on the petition, the four demands, really. We have now had all of the fees waived for all of the rental spaces in, in both cities. We can gather free of charge now and, and do what we need to do on these lands. We are having an advisory council um, selected, talks of, of a selection committee for that. And we are currently discussing um, a staffing model for the city of Kitchener. So we are optimistic. We are keeping it positive. Um, I know every hill, every, every hole, every bit of this land now. I will never look at Victoria Park the same. I, grow, I, I wake up in the teepee. I hear the birds. We have hawks. We have foxes. There are two skunks. Um, we have learned uh, all of the tiny little bits and pieces of this space. It has literally changed my life. I have no reason to go back to my apartment. I do not want to go back to my apartment because um, I have found something here with my daughter, with the people here, the community here about that has shown me that land-based learning, particularly for Two-Spirit, um, queer and trans youth, is so necessary. 
um, when my daughter goes out and forages and, and can identify some plants, that is amazing to me. Um, so it is not a land claim. You know, I am from Six Nations. I would love to return this entire city back to Six Nations 100%. That's not what we were doing. Um, we are not under the same threat of violence as 1492 Land Back Lane. Um, you know, I visited them a number of times in their in their first weeks. This is not that at all. We are holding the space. We are holding the land until we get some some answers, some visibility, some progress on what the cities refer to as reconciliation. So that is what we're doing here. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything else or um, anything else I can add to that in the moment, but um, I do thank you for the, uh, for the invitation to speak today. Thank you so much, Amy. And it's great to see, it's so great to see the, the camp behind you and, and to kind of hear the children playing, it's amazing. Um, okay, so our, uh, well, welcome, Aladia. Good to see you. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Phil Montour. Um, so Phil is Mohawk from Six Nations of the Grand River um, from 1975 to July 20, uh, 2002. He was director of the Land Claims Research Office at the Six Nations of the Grand River, where he developed and supervised a long-term research program about Six Nations of the Grand River lands that are no longer used for its benefit and for which no crown letters patent have been issued or legal surrender obtained under prevailing legislation. Phil was key in developing the 1995 litigation uh, that the Six Nations of the Grand River have against Canada and Ontario seeking an accounting for all the lands and resources within the Haldeman Tract no longer under the control of Six Nations. Phil continues to work on this mega trial as it continues to work its way through the courts. In 2002, Phil established his own company, Native Lands, to study and develop land tenure for Indigenous peoples in Canada, the United States, and Central America. He has been a representative on land claims and Indigenous land rights at the provincial and national levels, as well as at the United Nations. The ultimate goal of his work is to establish a secure, stable, and independent economic base for the Six Nations peoples, as was the intent of the Six Nations treaties. Thank you very much, Phil, for being here. Well, first of all, congratulations to uh, Amy and all uh, hard work they've uh, undertaken this. Uh, you know, it's true what you said, you got the truth and reconciliation report, you've got the Royal Commission on, on Indigenous Peoples, you've got the United Nations, um, and the Andrew. So we have everything, all the tools one needs to carry forward, and you would think there would be justice out there. But, uh, you know, the frustrations we face, I'm just going to give you the quick shot. That's the Haldeman Tractor, it's roughly 975,000 acres. And we are left with less than 5% of that. And that was set aside for us and for posterity to enjoy forever. So in the area where Kitchener is, you know, those lands were set for sharing. We, were, we agreed to share those lands with our neighbors. And we entered into 999-year mortgage, lease mortgages for those properties. And that was also to agree, you know, today... We should be getting an economic return on that those are mortgage payments, which have never been happening for us. So to share it in the common grounds and protect the archaeological uh, sightings of all of these areas that are basically they're all subject to litigation, which you see in that Haldeman track, that map that's up there. Uh, how one just proceeds to you know design and pave over and I'll go back to the architects. There's some responsibility in what you, you, you are doing as far as accountability for taking care of the land when you design something as such as this. Acknowledging and recognizing the, the, the original people on these properties is a very significant step forward. So, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen. And it can, it's, it's nothing new. It's, as I said, the tools are there that we should all be doing it. We should all be meeting with the municipalities. We should all be meeting with the provincial governments. We should all be meeting with the federal governments. 
that's not happening. It just is not happening. So then we have the frustration takes over. You've got these lands in, in, the, in the legal process, in the, before the courts, since 1995. That's a long way, but this is a humongous case, I must acknowledge that. And the resolve of this is going to be the biggest challenge for all of us. Because when you go through the history of this, you'll find out the Six Nations land were literally bankrolled in the beginning of what you enjoy today in Canada. From the Law Society of Upper Canada, to universities, to bridges, to cities such as Toronto, bonds and mortgages um, uh, dispersed to them and there's the return on investments. It's start going to be coming out in the court system. So there's a lot that needs to be dealt with. And sharing common lands with indigenous people throughout this all the trap. It's the very least that we can expect from anyone. The very least. And to hear what Amy's had to go through there and the frustrations. Well, in all fairness to the municipalities and, and they don't know what they don't know. This history was kept from us. You know, I started the research office in 1975. So it's taken a long time to get our history. The government, with the records, were kept kind of out of sight, out of mind on us. And I think this is one of the situations that Canada is really much like going down in the tragedy kind of kind of out that we were taught not to learn about these, these issues. And it's unfortunate, so I, I very much applaud the universities stepping forward with this. How we tie this into the architectural framework, that's a wonderful challenge. I mean, we, we can, uh, I'm looking for the, the fresh minds that are coming forward from this university. And I'll take the time, whatever you ask of me, to try and educate you on various pieces of lands. The leases that are out there, the leases that are not been honored, the transactions that would allow us to go to schools on certain areas, uh, the long term mortgages, the unkept promises for uh, trespassing to stop, only to have it more land expected us to alienate, the threat of our, our, our funds and our land and the Grand River Navigation Company. These are all going to come out. However, what I'm saying, I'm sure. 99% of people have never heard of it before. So it's a long, it's a big story. And it's, uh, you have every right to, to uh, I don't want to say demand, but expect, expect to be respected. I think that's the biggest thing. If we can educate the general public, at the very least we can expect is to be respected. Because our treaty, treaties based with all the crowns have been based on peace, friendship, and respect. And that's how we want to move forward in this. Uh, yes, sometimes things do get a bit chaotic. Frustration, tempers, racism comes out. Racism comes out very well. And so it's, it's alive and doing well in Canada, unfortunately. And it's only getting worse, unfortunately. So these are the frustrations that we're facing constantly. Um, I'm not sure on what more I can really uh, say to this, this group because there are legal duties to consult and accommodate on any developments. And when it comes forward from the, you get caught between the, the finger point between the federal government, which the Supreme Court of Canada has stated, who then places it on the provincial government, but under the DNA Act allows under the jurisdiction of the province. And under the Municipal Act, Ontario government say that is now the responsibility of the municipality that they will do to consult and accommodate First Nations. The development goes forward, encroachment happens on lands that are subject to litigation where disputes are, are, are pending. I'm, I'm not certain how we're going to get around that bridge. Um, I've got to call out the Kitchener and Waterloo areas. They have not been very cooperative with the Six Nations voters. I mean, the leadership, we've got to get this going. It shouldn't be up to uh, 
then all the credibility given to Amy and her group there uh, to be sticking their neck out the way we are and good for you. She never got arrested. Um, but I think uh, the respect in her moving forward is really, really positive. And all I can say is I, I totally support what uh, you're trying to do and get recognition and work co uh, collaboratively with uh, the bodies that you can work with. Uh, you have every right to be there. But how, what forms you do, we've got to be very respectful of our neighbors because there's a lot of people who support us and there's a lot of innocent third parties. They do not know the history of these lands and they invested all their lives for generations and generations. And the unfortunate part is we do have um, court cases that uh, prohibit us from basically uh, dispossessing third party interests, which you know, two wrongs aren't going to make a right. That part I do totally support. However, there's got to be a result to these issues somehow. And that's the challenge. How do we get there? How do we get to a compromise where we can live with our neighbors? And honor the peace, friendship, and respect that we were all entitled to. Um, well, with that, I will uh, basically just sign off on this. I have a little more to say. Thank you very much, Phil. So, next we have uh, Aladia Smoke. Um, I'm just going to introduce you, uh, but I've lost my window here. Here we go. Gigi Gabowik, Aladia Smoke, is Anishinaabe Kwe from uh, Abishikokang um, Lexel First Nation, with family roots in Alderville First Nation, Winnipeg, and Toronto. Aladia has worked in architecture since 2002 and founded Smoke Architecture as principal architect in 2014. She is a master lecturer at Laurentian's McEwen School of Architecture. Aladia has served on the RAIC's Indigenous Task Force since its inception in 2015. Um, and Aladia was on the unseated international team of Indigenous designers and architects representing Canada at the 2018 Venice Biennale. Current professional work includes post-secondary, community, and multifamily residential projects, working with First Nation and institutional clients. Thank you so much for being here with us, Aladia, and it's great to meet you virtually. Um, I was, We've, we've crossed paths a few times, but it's really good to see you here. Well, thanks so much, Amina. Uh, yes, I was hoping we could have coffee and then there was pandemic and then yeah. we <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe we can still get a chance. Yeah, I've been okay. following your career with bated breath because we need more <laughs> of us Indigenous women out there in the design world making a difference. <laughs> so thank you. So I know much. that you will. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, um, thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, Bojo, Ani, Obishikakang and Donjaba, as Amina said, um, Wabishki Maingan and Dodem, Kejigabuik and Nishnakas. So, I'm uh, a lady of smoke, and uh, my Anishinaabe name means she's quick. So, uh, it's good because. Uh, how how long do I have, folks, to to speak? It's seven ten. What what would you suggest? I can go long. I can go short. I think fifteen minutes should be good. Yeah. Yeah, we're still good with fifteen. Okay, no problem. Um, so uh, thanks so much again for having me. And uh, my my clan is White Wolf Clan. And as Amina had introduced, uh, I've got family kind of all over the place. Alderville First Nation, and I grew up uh, close to Sioux Lookout. Uh, Laxol First Nation is the other name for my home community. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen. And let's just see here if we can. So uh, speaking of unceded land, uh, right now I wanted to uh, acknowledge that uh, the territory I'm on uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, as it's known now, um, one of the areas around here is called uh, Toronto, which is trees over the water. And uh, it's been Algonquin territory, Mississauga territory, Haudenosaunee around here. Uh, lots of uh, nations have come here since then as well. So uh, it's a complex territory I, uh, I'm joining you from right now. Um, 
And that's true of most territories these days, very complex territories. So this territory that I'm going to speak with you about first is Ottawa. And of course, named after the Ottawa peoples. Um, and uh, this is also Algonquin territory. We did a concept design, myself and some other Indigenous designers. Um, so in 2017, Justin Trudeau uh, announced that the former U.S. Embassy would be repurposed as space for Indigenous peoples. This is on unceded land, and the Algonquin, whose territory this is, um, were not mentioned in the gift. So it became a pretty hot potato issue for us. Um, we worked with Assembly of First Nations. They invited us. Uh, to collaborate with Inuit, Taparit, Kanatami, and Métis National Council. Uh, and they commissioned our team to develop a concept uh, to imagine what this very Beaux-Arts building, highly colonial architecture, might become, how it could possibly reflect the diversity of Indigenous peoples in uh, Canada. So our elder Winnie Petawanaquat inspired us. <laughs> it was great that she joined our design team. She said, design something our grandmothers would be proud of. So this was our team. We had Wanda Dalacosta. She was the very first First Nations woman architect ever to uh, be registered in Canada. I am the third. Um, Winnie Pitawanaquat, um, that's our elder who in, uh, informed the design process, David Fortin, and our wonderful, excited young team, uh, Larissa, Claudio, Nicole, and Jason Sirkin. Um, so it was important to us to have a diverse team representing at least a few of the men many, many nations across Canada uh, and uh, Turtle Island. First thing we did was we established an axis with the centennial flame. So we called this the um, time immemorial flame. <laughs> so Canada has been around and lit this flame in honor of the 150th birthday of Canada. Of course, we've been around since time immemorial. So we established that axis straight away, kind of just um, yoinked this uh, very unused um, vacant lot right across from our parliament building, if you can believe that. It hasn't been used for anything except queuing for parliament tickets. Crazy. What do we do with this Bozart building? Oh my goodness. It's, um, it's sort of that old style of uh, doing architecture where it harkens back, way back across the ocean to uh, forms of architecture that developed in a totally other place really hard question, lots of iterations. Uh, we uh, developed first, as I said, that nation to nation axis uh, and thought about what we could do with that outdoor space, embrace it immediately, welcome people into this new territory uh, where we might have um, pre-contact architectural forms that are renewed season over season. We might have um, uh, our traditional ways of getting together, our pre-contact ways of getting together, drumming and dancing. Um, we have uh, the land, we want to honor Mother Earth. So uh, this garden and celebratory space invites visitors uh, into a year round space of programmed activity. Here's a rendering of that space um, and what it could maybe become. What do we do with this Beaux Arts building? It's been vacant for 30 years. Uh, nobody else has, been, has managed to be able to inhabit it. Um, the building envelope is in rough shape. So we placed this uh, building into a vitrine, sort of like what you would see in a museum. This is how we used to do things. So we, this vitrine is inspired by the wigwam shape where we have panels of glass that come and wrap this building to try and improve its envelope. Um, we cut a sunlight shaft down into the center of the building so we could con to connect with uh, Shkaga McQuay down here, uh, Mother Earth and uh, Father Sky up here so that daylight creates a sense of connection for everybody inside because there were such hierarchical spaces inside this building so dark and uh, cut off from each other and we wanted to open the whole thing up. Uh, this is an image of the first uh, ramp. We wanted everybody, including those with mobility challenges, to have the same experience of the space. So we created this 
ramp up to uh, an east doorway, east, of course, being the direction of new beginnings. <laughs> How can we do things differently? Uh, so we embrace that space with this outer uh, framework system. So um, we have uh, an inspiration from the Algonquin wig wigwam, which has an outer structure that holds on those panels. And uh, so this is reminiscent of that bent wood structure. This is a photograph of some of the exciting spaces outside of the building that that bent wood structure idea creates. Then we wrap it with regalia. Elder uh, Winnie Pitawanaquat, she said to us, um, even though this is a difficult gift and we don't know quite what to do with it, it's hard to accept. Uh, we can honor the spirit of the gift, which was given in a spirit of goodwill. And we honor that with a blanket like wrap. Uh, in marriage ceremonies, sometimes that gesture of wrapping two people in a blanket means a uniting of two unique individuals. This is some sections through that blanket wrapping. Uh, then what do we do? Well, we apply regalia. So um, one of the ways of honoring ourselves and others is to uh, be careful and wrap this beautiful regalia around ourselves on special occasions. So this regalia might be reminiscent of snowshoes or feathers or jingles, uh, maybe drying frames. So our idea was that every one of our communities across Turtle Island would send a handcrafted item uh, sort of along a similar framework. And uh, maybe youth could be involved with this, elders could be involved with this, uh, the local artisanal traditions and graphic uh, culture of that material culture of those communities could come together and rotate in a constant giving and sending back and giving and sending back as these items age and are sent back to the communities with the experience of having been present in Ottawa so that our nations are physically present in the space. Uh, some of the inspirations for that regalia might include our traditional beadwork or uh, snowshoe lacings or basket work. Here's a, a model of the space um, that we had commissioned. Now, interestingly enough, because this is unceded land and Algonquin were forgotten uh, in the mentioning of the gift, um, uh, the chief of Algonquin Nation came and built a wigwam on the space and protested uh, the nature of this gift, how it was given, and uh, their participation in since it was on their um, unceded territories. And uh, we had planned a big opening ceremony. AFN was really hoping it could get done. We ended up not going forward with the uh, opening ceremony because we thought it might not be respectful, uh, given that those negotiations with Algonquins were still in, in uh, process. So this beautiful model, nobody really saw it. <laughs> but nonetheless, we have this uh, in our memories. And we talked with Métis National Federation and Inuit Teperit Kanatami about this at length, along with uh, AFN. So uh, this is our imagination of how to perhaps inhabit this very exciting <laughs> space. Uh, I have about five minutes left. I'm going to share a little bit with you of this other uh, project. This is under construction right now. This is a counterpoint to the last one. This is um, in Scarborough. Uh, so this is the Centennial A Building expansion on uh, the, their Progress Avenue campus. The very first introduction to the building is this uh, honoring of the Mishomas teachings, so the seven grandfather teachings and the seven grandmother teachings, um, the Nokomis teachings. So this is, you don't always hear about the grandmother teachings and uh, Joseph, our elder and knowledge carrier informing this project reminded us of that. So on one side of these uh, columns, which actually one of them really supports the building, it's structural. He said on one side, the side facing out, that's the grandfather teachings. And on the side facing in, that's the grandmother teachings. And they rest on the original agreements, uh, representation of the original agreements um, governing inhabitation of this territory, which are uh, some of the um, some of those uh, agreements were recorded in wampum. So wampum is kind of a Haudenosaunee uh, element, but um, Anishinaabek also understand those treaties. So things like the dish with one spoon, where we all are responsible for uh, taking care of the territory together. 
Um, so the building rests on those original agreements and it rests on the individual expressions of them. Uh, the building follows the natural topography of the land. So uh, the inspiration for this was the Medewagan, uh, the teaching lodge, which is a bent wood open work framework where you're directly in contact with the land because as the elder speaks, they're uh, pointing to the horizon and stories about when a bear visited the lodge and they're referencing those land-based teachings. So we wanted this informal learning space where students are gathering and sharing their stories and sharing their learning experience to be almost like that open bentwood framework, like a modern interpretation of that. Of course, we have a net zero approach with solar panels. Uh, the skin of the building we thought a lot about because it's a multicultural space. So many different uh, heritages uh, come to this place to share uh, teachings. So we thought about how could we make the pattern of the building reminiscent of some of the traditional graphic and material culture of the space. So beadwork, quillwork. Uh, maybe the lacings of those snowshoes, but also anybody who looks at a fish skin or anybody who looks at a snake skin understands this patterning. So that's what inspired this shape. Here's that uh, informal learning space I talked to you about, inspired by the Medewagan, following the topography of the land. Along the ceiling of this space, we have an undulating pattern, and we decided to honor the riverbed of Highland Creek, which runs uh, close by. So this represents the element of water, which is also associated with creation. So we have the Anishinaabe story of creation in the east to west direction because we go clockwise. And in the other direction, counterclockwise, Haudenosaunee go the other way. So we have the Haudenosaunee creation story uh, represented on that. And so now we have this meander of the river represented. Here it was sort of like not fully developed, but uh, you'll see it's going to show the meander of that uh, Highland Creek to honor it. Um, this is the, um, a space uh, inspired by Anishinaabe Roundhouse, Nami Itawigamig, um, which has a connection in all seven directions, so the four cardinal directions, up, down, and center, the self. So this is really the heart of the building, a space for drum ceremony. Um, it's a space where we can uh, meet in a circle, which, shockingly enough, is tremendously difficult to find in our modern buildings. Uh, we can't even sit in a circle, this egalitarian way of meeting where all of everyone has a value that is equal to everyone else and everyone has something wonderful to contribute. So hard to find, we put one in this building. This is the courtyard, here we honor Grandmother Moon. In the middle of the courtyard, we have a pattern of lines that cross the noonday full moon days. And all of the things we used to do out on the land, that's how we name our months. And those are listed out in here. And we've tracked the pattern of the sun on the full moon days so students can look at what our calendar once was, where we remembered our connection to land. These are some of the principles that we brought through the building. That principle of gateway and mirroring outdoor areas. That principle of having a heart to the building that um, has a direct connection to earth, a direct connection to sky, and those four directions, the teachings associated with them. It's accessible to everyone. And it honors those, uh, the, the concept that we are rooted in the land, that we are connected to the sun, <clears throat> both technologically and spiritually. And this is meant to be a reflection of what reconciliation might mean. A mainstream building that integrates indigenous principles right in the bones of the building. Uh, we were actually inspired by this book of poetry. The client asked us to read this book and then make a building that meant the book. I'll just share this last quote. We have, as a human race, moved so far apart from each other that we need to take the proper steps to come together. Understanding who we are individually, as nations, as countries, as continents, as the world, are all part of the next step. So that's Chief Stacy Laforme uh, from Living in the Tall Grass. Thank you so much, Aladia. Um, thank you, all three of you. Um, 
I am really honored to to kind of have this opportunity to to be in the same virtual space <laughs> as you all today, and um, and yeah, and and for the benefit of of everyone here, um, to to hear the work, the really important work that you're all doing. Um, so I have I have a number of questions. Uh, some of them are kind of big, <laughs> big questions, I guess. Um, and I think in some ways you all have addressed them um, in your work, whether uh, whether you mention it today or, or um, in other um, in other venues where where I've seen your your work. But um, I think one one really pressing question that has been I think on the minds of a lot of us recently is is of course the question of climate crisis um, and environmental racism. And so I was wondering if you could each speak to the importance of the land back movement within this context. Um, I know within your work, Phil and Amy, um, you know, I really see the importance of like indigenous governance and sovereignty over land and, and maintaining uh, the health of the land for all our relations. Um, and Phil, you've mentioned uh, the way in which Six Nations contains um, and protects a large swath of Carolinian forest. Um, and Aladia, you also, um, you know, you mentioned working within the Dish with One Spoon uh, Treaty territories um, and, you know, within the idea that different nations are sharing the resources um, and gifts from the land without taking too much or without taking more than they need. So how do we see I guess within your area of work, how do we see architects um, who I consider people who compose um, space from materials that of course come from the earth um, and which often consume large amounts of energy, um, how do architects respond uh, to the climate crisis? So I know, I know they're big questions, um, but I think feel free to speak to, to whichever points um, you feel are important within that. I don't know if uh, maybe, um... Amy or Phil wants to speak first. Uh, I, this is sort of, a, it sounded like an architecture specific problem, but the thing is that um, inhabiting territory has happened long before there was a spe uh, specialized profession of architecture. In fact, we didn't used to need specialized architects because everybody kind of knew what to do. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I could see, you know, a little bit about, and, and I've actually, um, just joined another uh, working group sort of on um, climate justice and climate action um, recently and discovered that uh, some of the settler folks didn't even know the land that they were actually on. Um, as we went around and introduced ourselves, you know, uh, my my friend and I, Sean, do, do our introductions in our language. Um, we speak of the lands we're from, we speak of the lands that we currently live on. And nobody else did and i wondered what it was they were doing what what kind of work were they doing that they didn't even know the lands on which they lived they they weren't able to speak to the territory um they weren't able to speak to the people that currently live there as well as historically lived there and um it made me wonder what we're what we're doing in climate justice know the land <laughs> incorporate the land like Aladia spoke so so wonderfully about um go out on the land sit on the land be with the water um know what you're doing and on whose lands you're doing it um you know the first peoples are the most affected by um, environmental racism and climate crises know what you're doing on those lands um we do, we kind of do. We kind of always know where we are. We know the, the nations in which um, we know Mother Earth, our connection is is so strong. And I think when it comes to climate and start with that foundation, know where you are, know the people that, that lived there, that currently live there and um, get to know Mother Earth. <laughs> I think that's um, a really good place to start. One of the things that we're doing at Six Nations is we're going to the climate development mechanism to the United Nations, and we're actually asserting our sovereignty that we do have a right, and it is our responsibility to take care of Mother Earth. And along with that is the reforestation and, and taking care of the, uh, our Carolinian forest, the waters, 
we're planning on a, a, a large solar solar farm to get off the electric grid so our people doesn't have to pay ridiculous electricity and have to make decisions between whether they can pay for electricity or eat. So we want to be, but it's, it's a step above where most people talk because Canada is fighting us on every turn. And we have every right to be doing this. It's our responsibility to make things better than they were before. When we deal with, unfortunately, developments taking place in that almost a million acres of the Haldeman trap. We can't stop it all. But what we can do is when we do talk to people, there's, it's going to be environmental, they call it mitigation, but we're calling it enhancements. We've got to make it better than it was. So those are the principles on how we're moving forward, but it's it's a tough fight. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking with people who just, the bottom line is their dollar and they move on. So we got to, we got to, it's a holistic side, side of the earth. And it's, it's not for us. It's for seven generations how you got to plan these things. It's just not a, a house flip. That's, that's the short sightedness that I see with people. So how that can be tied into something long term, whether through a design, phenomenal, phenomenal ideas that we've spoken of before. But how do we bring that holistic approach to everything? Because everything is tied back to each other. And it's, it's, all, it's all based on Mother Earth. So we're trying these initiatives. Is it a struggle? Absolute struggle. Absolutely. Um, but if we don't try it, doing the same old is not getting us anywhere. We've got to try and push that envelope as far as we can and use whatever it takes to get there. And if, if it means court challenges to development, it means court challenges to development. But we do support good development. I don't want to leave it out there that we're anti-development. We support good progressive developments that are carbon neutral or enhanced environment. So we inherited this colonial structure. Uh, people came here originally to Canada, the territory now called Canada, thinking that they'd make their fortune and maybe leave again. <laughs> but we're all here together and we're going to stay stick around. We're all sticking around, clearly. And so um, I think the key thing now is to try and figure out how uh, we can live together with and um, take care of this resource because we've inherited a system where in uh, extraction of resources is how we see land. And that is uh, clearly not a healthy way to be. We have to start getting back to those patterns of symbiosis with uh, Mother Earth. And that is critical. So everybody looks at the institutional structures we've inherited, that institutionalized racism, that way of looking at land as though it's merely profit, it's waiting to be turned into profit, and you, it's easy to feel helpless. So people ask, what can I do? Um, well, uh, um, I think um, you're absolutely right, uh, Phil and, uh, and Amy, that um, uh, we see ourselves as belonging to the land. It is our responsibility to take care of it. And uh, I think if you connect, here's the first step. If you uh, figure out uh, what uh, Indigenous peoples uh, speak for your territory where you live today, and what they are trying to accomplish in regards to that territory, just get behind them. That's all you have to do. Just get on the boat because they're already trying to paddle that canoe in the right direction. They just need more paddles in the water and we can turn it around. So I would say that's a great first step. <laughs> and I have found every First Nation I've ever worked with is doing amazing things um, to try and turn it around for their territories because we belong to territory. Land does not belong to us. And our elders tell us that all the time. So Henby Inlet, one of our one of my wonderful clients, they did a wind farm just recently. And I mean, that's an amazing accomplishment for such a tiny little community to have accomplished a whole wind farm. So every First Nation. I have ever worked with is working on something tremendously exciting. Nobody knows about it because nobody really understands that what we are fighting for is the viability of all of our territory, the territory we now share. Yeah, I, um, 
I really appreciate, you know, I think this emphasis on getting to know the earth. I think I think that's shared among, you know, all of us doing this work. Um, and I really appreciate what you're saying, Phil, about environmental enhancement um, versus kind of the mitigation of damage, um, about giving more than you take. Um, and, you know, I, I think what, uh, what you were just saying, Aladia, too, about kind of, um, you know, seeing, seeing which, like what communities are doing within a region and kind of getting behind it, putting your, your paddle in the water. Um, I think that's such a nice way to put it. And, um, I think it's so true. Um, but maybe, and maybe this is a question more so for kind of urban indigenous folks, um, like myself, but I think, and, and this, this question might be a bit tricky, so, but it's something that's on my mind a lot. Um, and I think with other discussions, uh, with other urban indigenous folks as well. Um, but, uh, today actually, uh, with, within a, a kitchen table that we have, I think, I think I saw Kim Anderson on here earlier. Um, but we were talking about, um, urban indigenous peoples and, and kind of, um, what it means to be displaced from your own homeland and, and kind of within a different territory. And so, uh, within this province, within Ontario, 85.5% of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people live off-reserve in urban and, or rural areas. Um, and I guess within the context of land back and, and access to land, there is sometimes tension, I guess, um, within urban Indigenous communities, um, between urban indigenous peoples who have been dispossessed and displaced from their home territories through various mechanisms of colonialism, and those that, while also dispossessed of large swaths of their homelands, continue to live within their ancestral or treaty territories. Um, and I guess myself as a mixed and displaced uh, indigenous person, um, an uninvited guest on Haudenosaunee neutral and Anishinaabe territory without a clear homeland, um, I often wonder about the kind of treaty responsibilities that I carry um, within another nation's territory and how to stand in solidarity with the needs and wants of both displaced indigenous populations and local indigenous treaty holders. Um, and again, I acknowledge that this is maybe a difficult question, but I think um, I'm just, you know, I think about it a lot. Um, and, and I guess also, you know, how do we honor the treaty agreements um, that are established both pre and post European contact um, on the lands that we find ourselves within. And then I guess finally how, you know, how might these responsibilities extend to non-Indigenous treaty people and uninvited guests who now consider this region home. Now, I think, I guess what Aladia was saying kind of touches on this, but I, I guess I just wonder if any of you have any thoughts on navigating this, um, this kind of terrain. Oh, that was pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I don't know. I I just my comment is the the Haudenosaunee are, are are values and principles are based on the three three items I mentioned: peace, friendship, and respect. And a lot of that is respect for the earth, friendship among each other, because all of our, our treaties are they're, they're pretty a bit different, you know. It was it was based on sharing the land. Um, you know, we talk about the dish with one spoon about sharing our land with our our, our, our fellow nations out here pre uh, pre uh, visitors coming to the territories and what about the stopping the, the jealousies among each other and greed and the, uh, beaver wars. So it, it was it was just common sense that if we were going to survive we had to have these values with each other and respect as we move forward. Um, so until you know the knowledge and, and learn the history, that's the biggest thing about all of this, what you're talking about. Is our history and on our lands and our rights and how to move forward on it. You know, we, I've got so many, like even our hunters, they win, they win court cases, but it seems like it's one court case at a time because one court case does not apply to another hunter because someone posted no trespassing sign and 
there goes your right to a harvest. And it's arbitrarily done. Although the courts say otherwise, you get caught in the, it's a boogeyman story out there. It depends on who you talk to at any given time. And it's very unfortunate. There's no consistency. Um, I think the biggest part that's missing has come out in the studies that have been done since ever since I've been around working on these uh, issues is the education of a non-native society. That's what badly, badly needed. It's missing. Um, great steps have been made, great promises have been made, but now we need the action. That's what we really need is the action to implement these. And education is the biggest part of what's missing throughout that. All, of our, all the educational sectors, all levels. I'm sorry to say, but it's really falling down. So until we learn this, uh, it, it, it's hard. It's, it's hard, like, they're just not going to know. Um. Yeah, and I, you know, adding to both, uh, to everything that uh, Lady and Phil have both spoke to, um, the, the, know the land, obviously, um, start with the foundation of, of the, you know, so-called Canada, the, you know, Canada would not be a nation if it hadn't started to make treaties, the legal basis of our country be based on treaty. Um, when the mayors arrived, we threw the Turo at them, the, um, the dish with one spoon, um, we're flying all the flags here, uh, learn about the land and the original historical legal basis of each of these lands. But all three organizers, co-founders here are um, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe. So we put up a Cree <laughs> teepee. We have Cree folks here. We had to ask the Cree. I wasn't putting up a longhouse. Uh, we weren't putting up a wigwam. Um, we asked the, the Cree folks that are here on this territory for that knowledge, for that help. Um, we work with the people that are guests on these lands as well. They're, you know, Aledia's um, uh, PowerPoints there. Your knowledge of all of the peoples on all of the territories, invited and uninvited, is so key to the way in which we will be able to move forward in these um, conversations. You know, and as Phil said, yeah, we don't know what we don't know. Um, you know, the mayors, you know, I'm a social worker. My partner here is a social worker. The other one's an artistic director. But we threw treaty law at the leaders of these cities. They didn't know what we were talking about. Um, they had to start there. They had to start with that homework. So all of those things, I think, are going to benefit all of us if we can start to to learn on that we've brought into these, these situations from our, our from the colonial structures that have grown on these lands in order to get back to the knowledge from the first people. So I've had the benefit of li listening to the other two speakers again. You, you see how I strategically do this. <laughs> Um, so thank you uh, so much for your thoughts, uh, Phil and Amy. And I think that um, uh, what uh, I, I'm trying to think of a story to share, because when our elders are trying to convey thoughts, they always use stories. So uh, my story is uh, kind of indicative, maybe, of a lot of Canadian stories um, where I was not raised with my teachings. Uh, I was not raised with my language. My grandmother my great grandmother was uh, the last woman to have spoken, the last person in my family to have spoken the language that uh, was supposed to be mine. She passed on when I was three. And so I patched it together from listening to elders. Um, well, ever since I was about 16 and I realized, man, there's a huge mi missing gap in my own life. And I think about all those people across Canada who came here and maybe left behind their teachings from where they came from. My husband uh, has a diverse heritage. He's a bit of Lithuania, a bit of things we don't know. Uh, he says he feels like a cultural orphan. I think a lot of us feel like that. 
um, because even the people who came here from across the ocean lost a lot of their teachings. Even before they left, some of them lost those teachings. But we have knowledge carriers still who have been working tremendously hard off in the backdrop to try and maintain and pass on some of the perspectives from this land, the things that took million, like thousands of years to learn here, and they've uh, been keeping it safe for us. They're still alive and they're getting older and we need to listen to them now. Um, so I've met, I've, been trying my best, uh, along with, you know, becoming an architect and learning architecture and, you know, all the things you do to support yourself as you do that and founding a business, but listening to those elders, every single chance I get, um, and searching them out, uh, searching out those opportunities. And every time I work with an elder or a knowledge carrier on one of my projects, I learn something amazing every single time. And so I would really urge anyone uh, who's feeling that disconnect to think about maybe even if I've lost my teachings from way back across the ocean, even if I don't have any ancestors left to tell me those amazing things that were learned on that land way far away, maybe it's my birthright now that I live here to listen to the knowledge carriers who have been working so hard to keep the knowledge that is still here. It's an amazing treasure and most Canadians have been cheated out of it uh, through the forces of colonialism and through the forces of institutionalized race racism. But we still have a chance uh, to avail ourselves of that rich uh, heritage of re revolutionary thought. I think you will be amazed if you get to teach uh, listen to a knowledge carrier, a real, uh, an elder from your territory, uh, you will be blown away. <laughs> it's so quiet and they often tell stories. Um, and sometimes the stories start off a little slow and you don't know where they're going with it. But at the end, you're like, whoa. <laughs> so every time it's like mind blown. So, you know, do it as a treat for yourself because you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> you live here. It's uh, part of you. And uh, unfortunately, it's been excised from so many of us. So what Amina said about uh, not having territory, not feeling like you have a land that you own, well, you're here now. <laughs> and you know what? Um, Every elder I've ever spoken with says we're all indigenous from someplace. It's just some of us still have our teachings and some of us have lost them. But we kept them safe for you because <laughs> we've all figured it out at one point in time. Humans living on the land and listening to those teachings that originate in, in the land. Um, so I encourage you to just avail yourself of those teachings. And the more you do, the more you will feel at home. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I think I, I will pass it on to Mayuri. I do have one more question if there's time after that I, I'm curious to know the answer to, but I'm gonna, I think we'll open it up to the other, um, to the other participants here. Um, and if there's time, I'll, I'll ask my, my last question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks Amina and thanks Amy, Phil and Aladia. Um, if anyone from the audience wants to raise their hand and ask a question, I haven't seen anything in the chat, but I know a few of us have questions prepared, so please feel free. Um, I had a question for Amy. So um, something, we were reading the Yellowhead Institute's land back report in our class, and I noticed that they speak of a lot of the ways that Indigenous peoples are policed um, through what they call like infrastructures of theft. And recently, um, the kind of defund the police movement has gained really widespread popularity. And I was curious to learn more about how Indigenous peoples maybe agree or disagree or find solidarity with the Black Lives Matter um, ab abolition movement. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, you know, and I, like I said at the beginning, um, the original council for this um, occupation here was with uh, Black Lives Matter Waterloo Region and um, some members of the um, Afro-Caribbean Black Network um, here in Kitchener, Waterloo. So it was, um, you know, during COVID, as it started in um, March and April, uh, the shutdown, 
the deaths of both black and indigenous folks at the hands of police in Canada um, were that, you know, there were a dozen of, of indigenous folks that had been killed just in the time, um, just that lockdown. Um, the George Floyd murder um, sent us sort of all spiraling this community as well. So the original intent for this camp was actually defund police and land back our solidarity and our liberation is bound with our black community. Um, indigenous folks and black community members are bound together. And um, we still have the same council members. We still speak to the same folks. Um, every Friday, uh, Black Lives Matter Waterloo Region sits and occupies space in front of the police station here in downtown Kitchener. And every Friday, um, members of uh, O.C. Ganhun Hadaje here um, have been occupying the space with them there as well. Um, we uh, we see members of the ACB network here almost every day. Um, the community solidarity, the defund police, the ways in which, you know, we've seen the violence in the park, the racial violence, the gendered violence in the park. We see it. Uh, we, we've seen the cops come. We... Um, we know what happens when wellness checks occur with the cops. Uh, they don't go well. And um, when it is a white settler Canadian, um, it seems to be just fine. So we witness that. I, I could give research to the city of Kitchener just on this park. Before day has certainly, um, you know, put a spotlight on that for not that we've not already known that, but, you know, my history with the police, uh, again, uh, very prevalent in my life. I realized as I was going to the Solidarity for Abolition for the Police was um, voluntary. I was voluntarily driving to the police station to sit on that lawn. Um, very different experience for me. I would be the first one to be arrested if this occupation was to become violent uh, due to the racism inflicted on us. So our commitment to the solidarity with our black community members is very much prevalent in everything that we do. Um, they've contributed to us and we have contributed to them here in this um, space. Thanks, Amy. It's really insightful. Um, I still haven't seen, oops, I haven't seen any hands. Oh, sorry, I'm seeing some now. Um, I would like to just respond to your question before you move on. Um, I have a story to share that's, I think, pertinent. Um, people say defund the police, but actually, I think that's speaking in the negative. Um, I'll tell you a little story here. I was in a roommate scenario, and this wonderful woman from Cameron was staying with us. And um, she told me all these stories, the teachings that her uh, people shared. And she said, you know, whenever somebody's sad, um, we... Uh, don't really have depression <laughs> where we come from. It's a very odd idea. We go take that person and we dance with them and uh, everybody makes sure that they are felt loved. And, um, and then they, sh uh, she shared all these teachings. I can't do them justice, but they were these beautiful teachings. And then she had a crisis herself. She said, I don't feel that community support, that interconnectivity that I had, where I came from, where we were all, we'd, um, you know, dance and sing together. And we just didn't have depression. But here, you know, I feel, I feel differently. I don't have that connection. And then she had um, a mental health uh, challenge. She was in very serious crisis. And we uh, were afraid that my house, my uh, the roommates and I were afraid that uh, she was not safe. And so we decided to call Crisis Line. And uh, Crisis Line did not have staff. Uh, there was no way to get her help at that hour of the night. So we had to call the police. And we debated that for about two hours, uh, whether um, uh, we had to do that um, because I knew it would not go well, as Amy was saying. <laughs> uh, and um, we were really worried. Um, we were afraid that something bad would happen. So we did call the police and they um, forced her to open the door and then they handcuffed her. Um, 
and dragged her off. They were going to drag her off half clothed, but we insisted on clothing her. And then they handcuffed her and dragged her off. We didn't know what was going to happen to her. And I have never felt comfortable <laughs> calling the police for any kind of a problem that isn't directly related to violent crime, because I know it will not go well, just as exactly as Amy said. Um, that means that the police can't do that job. They are not equipped to do that job. I bet you they don't want to do that job. I bet you those calls are the calls they wish they never got. So I would suggest that perhaps we fund areas like the crisis center, who is trained in mental health issues, trained in getting people out of crisis in a nonviolent way, in a non-aggressive way, in a comforting way that actually helps them. Um, and we find those people instead because that's their job. That's their training. Okay. I just want to um, tell you, um, I teach at, at the Waterloo Architecture School. I'm a Mohawk Bear Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River. And uh, I suppose I'm an elder. Um, I just want to, uh, to say this is a very powerful uh, group of people. Uh, Amy, Phil, Eliade, you have uh, tremendous, uh, uh, big view of, of so many issues that are pressing. My own course is, uh, I've been teaching for 10 years, is, is very conciliatory and, and, and happy. Uh, I treat all my students as, they're, as if they're Indigenous people uh, and um, give them all of the deepest teachings I can of the Haudenosaunee culture, beginning with creation and going back thousands of years and up to the present moment to give them uh, a loving perspective on things. I, I was very fortunate. I, I had a tremendously powerful teaching from my elder, Jacob Ezra Thomas. I was very close to him and uh, it changed my life profoundly and, uh, um, so, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody, and uh, I thank you. I thank uh, Jacob Thomas for being with me during my teaching. And so I'll I'll say good night. Oh no. Oh no, Bill Woodruff. Thank you, Bill. Do you think we can take one more question from a student too? Just, or you're all open to that? Okay. Or did the speaker And then, so just one last question. Okay, um, I think Maddie's had her hand up also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, this is Simone. I'm using Maddie's camera. Um, I was just wondering, so, Amy, in the past, you've described like how deep traumas from systemic injustices compound intergenerationally, leading to like higher instances of mental illness, suicide addiction, and substance abuse in Indigenous communities across Canada. And so, I was wondering what role you think that like culture, culturally founded and holistic community-based healing processes play in emancipatory movements, and like in what ways they could be effectively leveraged, which you're kind of touching on with cases um, of. Um, police violence related to these um, mental wellness checks with cases like Chantal Morris. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Okay, sorry, I, I think um, I missed a little tiny bit of that. That was sort of cutting out, but I'm going to go with what I thought I'd heard in the intergenerational um, and holistic methods of um, teaching and healing um, and sort of how that focus or how that ties into all of those things. Um, it's definitely compounded, uh, you know, within my own family, um, the ways in which that we learn from each other, um, have completed my master's in social work, indigenous social work, uh, last year. I, um, the holistic te teachings and teachings that I have been able to incorporate in my own life and my own healing journey, um, has, have allowed me to openly discuss these kinds of things with my own child, um, we have conversations around police, um, 
the ways in which police do their jobs, the ways in which um, mental health workers do their jobs. Like Aladia was saying, um, police are not equipped to do some of the things that they do. I think that if you're going to go into professions of helping and healing, you should learn to work with people. You should learn about um, communication styles, um, all of the things in which um, I think Indigenous people really focus on in our holistic um journeys is um communication relationships um the interconnectedness of people um i again i missed a little tiny bit you were cutting out a little little tiny bit but i think getting to know people um the interconnectedness and relationship building that is not present in um job descriptions for police um but much more so for mental health workers um are you know, huge. If you're going to work with people, learn how to work with people. And I think um, my own child, I have a 20-year-old and a six-year-old here with me. They are more aware of the ways in which they would be treated by police um, than my mother, you know, would be. Um, they're more aware of the ways in which we are, you know, the most highly incarcerated, um, the most violently treated, um, all of those things as, as, as opposed to our parts and we have worked through those conversations together I speak more openly with my child than I think my mother did with me um, on those types of relationships but again I'm also teaching my mother um, a lot more um, it's intergenerational but it's going up up and down um, so I think that those conversations need to be had in all of the families um, that will be out on those front lines and we should all be out on those front lines Thanks, Amy. Just a quick thought to add. Um, I, I told you I was White Wolf Clan. Wolf Clan is, uh, Mayingan is a subset of Bear. Uh, Bear Clan is health and protection. So Bear Clan members were responsible to be doctors and police. Uh, just food for thought there. Uh, didn't really make much sense to me before I thought about it a little more. Um, why would you sort of know the use of herbs and know how to deal with people's uh, wellness issues as well as, you know, be responsible for protection of the community? Um, you know, dealing when dealing with people when their behaviors, uh, you know, were threatening the safety of others. And, you know, based on what Amy says, that's an interesting thought that you know, uh, after living thousands of years in this territory, that's how Anishinaabek decided to organize things. Thanks, Aladia. Uh, I think Amina can close up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, Phil, Aladia. Um, I think we're so privileged to have you all offer your insights and your words tonight. Um, and I think, you know, there's so much to think about. And I think with all, you know, with those of us here who kind of within the practice of architecture, this understanding of context and, and like, you know, the history, the kind of relationship with the land, the environment, um, and also histories of violence. And I think there's so much that, you know, these are things we don't often deal with within the practice of architecture. So I think, you know, there's so much here. And so thank you so much. Thank you for the work you're doing um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, and a, again, a big thank you. You know, I'm just kind of an invited guest in some ways as well as moderator here, but um, there's so much work that Mayuri and, and the whole uh, lecture series team put into this. So a uh, big shout out to all of them. So, Yama, miigwech, merci, thank you. Miigwech, Yama, bamupi, ona. Come on, Pete.